Hi, I'm uh, Molly Bourne. I'm one of the co-producers uh, of Cane Cole. And <laughs> this is special for me because this is a bit of a hometown crowd for me. Um, I, uh, um, I think Elaine may have mentioned um, this film started in 2019. Um, she and I worked on this in the beginning. Um, I was recording sound, Elaine mm -hmm. was shooting. Um, across several years, the film became something else and something really special. So um, I wore a lot of hats, as anyone who's a producer <laughs> knows. Um, location and um, talent scouting, um, research, a lot of research, uh, archival um, research, um, and, and, yeah, and just like thinking through story development, which we did a lot in, in the early days. And I am uh, Karen Sheldon. I'm the director of photography of King Cole and a co-producer as well. So again, if anybody wants to come ask questions, there's two mics here. So I invite anybody that has a question to kind of come on up. And here we go. Got a question right off the gate. All right, it works. <laughs> Hi. So. Uh, really great movie, by the way. I want to start off by saying that I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I also wanted to ask, though, uh, it seemed like there was a very deliberate, it, it was very deliberate that the, um, there weren't any name. there was a lot of great characters, but not necessarily names. Like, we talked, the, the only names that were really given were, like, the, the organic matter that would make the coal, and then the, the coal miners, and obviously King Coal himself. Would you mind talking about the, the decision uh, to make that? Yeah. Um, you know, Elaine talked a lot about how, you know, she didn't want this to be specifically about a single town or a single person or a single um, location, right? So it's, it's really kind of all of Appalachia and she wanted to make it feel um, almost like, a, I mean, as you can tell, it's a, she calls it a part documentary, part fable. And so almost like a fairy tale land to some degree, right? Um, and just to be sort of embedded in this place, get drawn into the story and sort of get taken along on a journey. Um, and so by not using location markers, by not necessarily naming any specific characters, you're instead just sort of taken along on this journey to experience the, the film and experience the place rather than, you know, be, be told details and things like that. So it was really sort of, a, I think, a choice to um, just allow people to really get enveloped in the, in the film and the story and the visuals and the sound design uh, more than anything else thank you great job yeah uh, I, I was wondering what the main sort of driver was to uh, have the storytelling be partly through that sort of folklorish or fairy tale like lens well I think just you know in the beginning when we were documenting these coal related cultural scenes it was a um, a verite observational documentary. So that was how we started. And I think in order to tell the story that we wanted to tell, it, it required this this imagination. And uh, this this film has been described as a an, an essay film or a hybrid documentary. And, and you can see there's a lot of elements there that, that were real life, that were happening in the moment, and others where the, the two girls, um, we, we placed them in a scene and said, you know, do what you would normally, do what you want to do, talk about what you want to talk about. Um, and that kind of became a magic of its own. And, and I think in order to think about what's next and imagine what might be next for this place, we have to, to, to dream. And I think that the form allows for that to happen. Thank you. Hey, Curran, uh, beautiful film. Well, thank I, you. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the optics behind the film. Um, you have these like beautiful, buttery focus roll-offs, awesome film-like halation. Tell me, how do you think about covering a film like this? How do you, what's your, uh, the visual language of the film? What lens choice are you making? What camera choice? And how do you approach all that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, we can geek out now, this is fun. Um, <laughs> No, it's actually really fun to watch this back to back with Country Brawlers because they're so wildly different visually. Um, but um, to answer your first question uh, on the lens choice, you know, the there's sort of two different worlds, right? There's there's the cool world, which um, Elaine uh, had the foresight of sort of shooting that originally as in a very locked down observational manner. So 
Um, so she shot quite a few of those different cold events, and then I shot a few of the, them as well, and we kind of worked in, in concert in that. And so they're all very observational, right? It's very locked down. You just watch action happen, you know, in, in scene. Um, and, you know, when we, when we started adding more sort of magical elements, you know, we wanted to visually show that there was a difference between these two worlds, and you can try to travel between these worlds, not only with sound design and not only with subject matter, but visually, right? Um, and so I did actually pretty extensive lens, lens tests. I, I got like six or seven different lenses, um, and I would take my buddy out to the woods, and we would just film with, in sort of different scenarios and see which one created the look um, that we most wanted to reflect kind of the, the, magical, the magical world of, of King Cole. Um, and so finally landed on a lens called the Voigtlander Heliar Classic 50 millimeter T1.5, if anyone wants to buy it. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we threw a little mist filter on the front, and that sort of created, created the look. Um, but the coverage was really interesting because when you look at something like uh, Country Brawlers where you're in a scene and you're just like, okay, I need a, I need a reverse shot, I need this one's t someone's talking, so I need this person nodding at some point, right? You're constantly thinking like that. Where in this film, it was much more of like, let's be patient. If we miss it, we miss it, right? It's much more of we are here to, to observe and let things happen um, and do it in the most elegant way possible. So it was very much more of a quality over quantity. You know, we miss what we miss, but we get what we get. Um, so that's sort of how we approached, you know, sort of the, the visual language of the, of the film. Hello, incredible film, um, loved it. I don't think I've any, ever seen anything like that. It was very unique. Um, I was curious about the two girls who were kind of the main characters of it. Were they like, you said you did some casting, so were they like actors or were they like random people from the town, from like Elaine's hometown or what was that like process like? Those, um, so Lainey and Gabby, Lainey's the redhead, um, and Lainey and Gabby, they um, live in, one lives in Charleston, one lives in Hurricane. And we found them, actually they, um, I went to a bunch of dance studios and, and looked for, um, girls we thought would be right for this film. And they both really stood out for, for different reasons. Um, Lainey's such a beautiful dancer. She took direction really well, as we found out during the screen test that Elaine and Curran did. Um, and, and Gabby, there was just something so magnetic about her. She's so vivacious, as you can tell. Um, we found out later, really, as we got to know them, that they both had coal backgrounds in their mm -hmm. family. So the scene yeah. uh, where uh, Gabby is with her grandmother, her mom, and her brother. That was that was all. That's her real family history. And she I was going to ask that. Yeah, yeah that's she, like her real story. Yeah. yeah, and she didn't know about it until they filmed that day. That's cool. Which was really special for us. And Lainey's dad is um, has been in the industry, coal industry, for a long time. And and that scene, you know, where they're in the bedroom and uh, they're working on the coal project. And Gabby asks, "Is coal or Lainey asks, is coal important to your family?" And you know, and Gabby's like not really sure. Well, I think she, you know, she kind of got to learn a little bit more about that role that it played, and 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 um, that was really special and something unexpected for us. So that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And I would just add, um, nothing in the film is scripted. There are there are um, situations that uh, we took Lainey and Gabby to, but then we just let them be them, right? So we use them sort of as a vehicle through the film. Um, but they're never told to say anything, so the real conversations they're having, they're just having the real cold projects they're doing, they're just doing, we just sort of place them in situations. Um, and even the, the King Cole funeral at the end, it's um, a event that basically Molly, Elaine, and producers, and pretty much everyone on the team planned the event, but once the event started, it's an hour and a half um, service, we just let it play, and so we, we hired a few extra cameras to cover that scene specifically, but no, nothing in the film outside of obviously the voiceover uh, is scripted, but we did place people in certain situations to, to see how it would play out. And I would add too, when we're talking about playing with form and, and documentary and, and incorporating those other elements, that scene in the bedroom where they're working on the coal project, um, we came up with, with questions that were things we could imagine being asked on a homework assignment mm. um, about coal, right? Is coal yeah. important to your family? Here are the different types of coal. And that was really it. It was just, we, we gave them those questions that were informed by our own experiences and they just took off from there and that was all them and it was oh, incredible. That's cool, yeah, awesome, thank you. Yeah, you kind of already explained the question that I was just gonna ask. I have to switch up the question I'm asking. I've done this a few times at this <laughs> point, know. yeah. 
Okay. I've heard Elaine say it a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> right. What I do want to say is coming from a place not featured, Western Maryland, I related so much that idea that you can be anywhere and relate. I mean, she's clogging at the end. My high school was the minors. Like, I was like, oh, this is my lived experience just in different places. So that was so cool. But my question is, I know as a filmmaker, it's so hard to include yourself to talk about your family and to talk about where you come from. And so I know Elaine's not here to really speak on this, but I want to hear about like, what was that process like? When did she decide to do that voiceover and how did that like <laughs> essay come through and what was that like? Because I know you say you're going to talk about your family. That's one thing. You're going to try to film yourself and talk about your own lived experiences. That's a whole nother thing. No, for sure. No, Elaine came, became the um, narrator of this film, sort of kicking and screaming uh, up to the last <laughs> moment. So uh, it was about a week before we picture locked, we had two different narrators. Um, one was Heather Hanna, who gives a speech at the end. And we actually did not know Heather Hanna. Elaine had never met her in her life until that day at King Cole's funeral. She just arrived and gave this unbelievable speech that became the end of the film. Uh, she has such a, just a, a beautiful voice. And so um, both her and Elaine would read a, Elaine's uh, voiceover. And you know, it finally became apparent that it, like, this is Elaine's story. And so she has to you know, actually be the person to deliver it. Um, and but it was not something she wanted to do. You know, she she's been writing uh, variations of this film and of the voiceover you heard for the last you know four or five years, um, and and it's been fairy tales. There's been all sorts of just kind of wild ideas, um, and eventually landed on this. But I think I mean for her, this is an incredibly personal film. Like her brother still works in the coal mines. Her her dad worked in the coal mines his whole life. Right, that's how he supported her, allowed her to go to school, allowed her to go to film school and have the life that she has. Um, and you know, there's there's very much a sort of black and white, good or bad conversation around coal. And I think what she has done so beautifully in in this film and. Um, and I think we're all, I mean, personally very thankful just to be along for the ride is that she has created a film that both sides are like, oh, I love that. You know, I love this pro coal film. And then sort of the anti coal, like, oh, I love how you took it to coal, you know? And it's, and it's kind of interesting. She's, she just has this unbelievable um, knack and ability to, to play in the gray area and, and somehow make it, um, you know, appealing and beautiful for both sides. That's what it's all about, that gray area. That's where documentary lives. Thank you. Exactly. Um, can I mention something? We've got a few people in the audience who actually worked on the funeral scene, including um, Samantha Huffman, who was a costume assistant, really helped bring to life uh, what you saw um, there with all the costumes and the flowers and um, all kinds of things she worked with. And Ben, who was an assistant director that day, actually, so um, who really helped us execute that. <laughs> The whole event. <laughs> ben was so. on the on the megaphone yelling at people. It you was have a, a lot of fun. I, yeah, I had a megaphone. You had a yeah, megaphone. He had a it megaphone and it was it, it worked out perfectly. But I just wanted to say that that scene um, we needed we needed all we needed everyone. Everyone had a role and it was really special and we couldn't have done it without you guys. My turn. Oh, is this on? Yeah. All right. So I have two questions. Um, one, I just wanted to hear more about the archival footage and how that was acquired and then what that process looked like because it's incredible and I think maybe a lot of people don't realize they're seeing footage that like until you did this movie really no one had seen in a very long time so I'm really interested in hearing more about that and then also there was a specific credit that I was curious about that I actually heard some other people like mumbling about too and I'm, so I know I'm not the only one who wonders what a breath artist is what is a breath artist um, I will have to do a demonstration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. Um, well, I'll talk about the archival. Do you want to talk about show to Kate? Okay. Uh, so the archival footage is is just, I mean, it's astonishing. Every time I see it, I'm blown away. It was filmed in the late 30s and early 40s uh, in the in Fayette County area, and it was our to our. Our understanding is that it was paid for by the coal company. Uh, they hired a filmmaker to shoot um, this home and garden series, the, the color footage at least. And they gave seeds to the people that lived in the coal camps and had them grow these beautiful gardens and then they would film it and then it was played at the company store. Uh, and all this was in the basement of the archives at the Capitol complex in, the, in Charleston. 
And there's a, a great archivist there, um, Dick Faust, who we worked with, who knows where all these treasures are. And uh, you know, we wanted some life and 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 to show like the the Elaine's voiceover says that our soot covered lives can be beautiful. Like we wanted to show um, what life was like there, and that it and that footage is just it has never been. I mean, I don't think it's ever been seen, and we got it um, digitized into a higher resolution into 4K, uh, so that it would r just shine. You know. Um, and the Mingo Oak, uh, Elaine, that was sort of a late addition, if I remember. She uh, called up uh, Dick, who helped us, and, and asked about that. And, and I have never seen that before. I mean, that, that was sort of a late addition that came later in a separate set of, of archives. But really, we have him to thank. He is just um, really knowledgeable. And I, I would encourage any filmmaker, writer, anyone working on a project that might invo involve archives, he's he just has this uh, catalog in, this, this, in his mind, and uh, we're lucky to have him. Yeah, so breath artist. Um, what's really cool about this film and sound design is a lot of the sounds that you hear that you probably think are either instrumentation or some sort of just weird sound effect is actually a human voice. Um, and so at, at Big Ears Music Festival, uh, two marches ago, uh, Lane was at a, a show with a guy named Shodake, and he is a, a breath artist, and she just heard. He also is a beatboxer, and he does a lot of different just uh, vocal tonalities. No, something like that. He has <laughs> vocalities, I think he calls them. Um, and she is like, man, this, like, this sounds like almost like the forest or King Cole, because there was always some thought around, like, how do we personify King Cole? You know, does he has he his breath? Is he a drum? Is you know all these different things that he could be? And then when she saw Shodake, she's like, "Well, this this is it." And so we, he uh, is from Baltimore, so he actually drove over and in, in Mangahela National Forest, we took him out and just set him up with all these different microphones, and for about an hour and a half, he just went through a absolute trove of different breath voices from crickets to waves to thunder um, and he can bird just song. Hmm? sorry to interrupt you the bird song the bird song I mean just some just wild stuff and he's done a few Q&A's and he does it live for audiences um, which is really cool and I won't attempt to do it because I, I can't but um, it's just an incredible incredible thing so you can look, up, look him up uh, his name's Shodake and uh, if you go to King Cole Films Instagram I'm sure we have some videos of him up there if I remember correctly yeah. um, so you can actually see him perform it live. It was pretty cool. I'm curious, uh, as you've taken this around the country, what has been the reaction from other cultures uh, to how integral coal is to Appalachia? I think it's kind of twofold. I think the first is people are um, both surprised, right, to see just how much part of the culture coal is. Right, every time I think people talk about coal, they're like, look, it's a dying industry, get over it, move on, right? But it's so embedded in Appalachian culture, right? We have coal pageants, we have coal fairs, we have coal runs, we have all these different things where the industry has become more than just a job, right? It's, it's um, a brotherhood and a sisterhood, it's a community, it's belonging, right? It's purpose. And so when you take all that away, and in a mono economy, when that's no longer there, you know, what is, what is left, right? I mean, the, the film asks, who are we without a king? Um, and so I think, I think that's one, is that, that sort of the surprise and, and sort of the deeper understanding people have about Appalachia. Uh, and the second quick thing is just that, you know, I think a lot of people, though they're not from a cult culture, see in their own culture, wherever they're from, their own place, their own location, their own home state, town, country, whatever it is, um, a piece of themselves in this film, right? It's like we all have connections to the place that we're from, and so... Um, you know, I think people have actually been very emotionally moved because they see, you know, their communities, their timber towns, you know, their rust, rust belt towns, right, their steel towns um, in this film. And so I think a lot of people have been uh, very emotionally moved in that way. We were just talking backstage about how we were really moved seeing the film this time around. Like, it's been a while since we'd seen it, and it was just like a different experience this time around, I think. Um, okay, sorry, I messed this up already. Is that Claire from Coat of Arms from Old Pioneer <laughs> Film? Don't, don't do that. Playing tomorrow this night? This is about you, not about me. <laughs> All right, so the power of women in this film is phenomenal. And on my second viewing of it, I was touched by how intentional you were with that. Can you speak to that a little bit, Molly? Hey. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think about the woman we saw fishing, um, who our associate producer Clara found, the woman we saw making the casket. Um, you know, I, I, I remember conversations where we were, we were, we were just looking to find a lot of people doing traditional um, arts or practices. That was a, a part of the film, you know, just people who were making something, creating, um, building something, dancing. Most, now that I think about it, a lot of those people were women. Um, and, you know, I think some of that was intentional and some of it was um, maybe like the thinking about the mushroom foraging or the tree planting, just kind of based on who showed up that day. Uh, but I do think in so many of those scenes with Lainey and Gabby interacting with those people, they are interacting with women. And I, I'm, that, that feels um, like maybe something I hadn't considered as much before. I wonder what you think, Corinne. Oh. Um, Sorry to put you yeah, on the yeah. spot. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think you're right. I, I think to some degree, we're, you know, Elaine, Molly, Clara, we're all looking for people who are actively moving forward, right? They're, they're looking to the future and seeing, like, what is Appalachian in the future? And that just, a lot of those people happen to be women. Um, you know, that's, woo! Um, so I think that can, you know, that could, you could sort of take that and think about it in a lot of different ways, but I think it was just kind of true. It was just kind of like no matter who we sort of looked around and tried to find, it, the women were the, the, the people who were stepping up. So I think that's probably the main reason they're out there doing stuff while we're just sitting around. You know? Hi there. I have a quick question. Um, as a storyteller myself, when it comes to diving into some of these um, story, other people's stories that we that we go through. I, some of the things that I love is um, the, the, the hidden gems, the I didn't know that. And I'm wondering, you guys are from here, but what are some of the things that you learned about the Appalachian culture um, that you didn't know? Some of those little gems. I think I, I, I don't know that I would have had the opportunity to see Fred Powers teaching kids about, or telling kids about his coal mining experience in the classroom. I wouldn't, I don't know that I would have gone to the coal dust run, um, or, you know, so many of those, those moments that I think are very deeply affecting to me, um, and uh, kind of made me think about coal in ways in my own life, and I'm the granddaughter of a coal miner in my a couple of my um, family members are here tonight who grew up in Farmington where there is, you know, coal culture is really embedded and still is today. And I think it just made me think a little bit more about sort of my own family history and connection to it. And, um, and I think maybe just also on a personal note, I, um, you know, my career has been in nonfiction storytelling and this is something totally different. It was a departure for all of us. Um, doing something that incorporated these these other elements, and I think that was a, a risk worth taking. And I and I think that made me realize that um, that experimenting with form can be really gratifying. Uh, yeah, I would just say, especially being married to Elaine during this entire process, is uh, she did a lot of a lot of research, right? Death rituals and. Um, fairy tales and fables and all these different things and, and, and a lot of the stories that came from Appalachia um, and then the archival that, that Molly helped um, source is you know, the story of the Mingo Oak. There's just so many sort of small stories um, that I had, had never heard of before and, or grew a, got a deeper understanding about. Um, but I think more than anything else, it's just that you know, I, I grew up in West Virginia, just about 45 minutes from here, but I was never sort of embedded in coal in the way that the southern West Virginia is, right? The way it's real central Appalachia is, and that's where Elaine grew up. And so, like, she grew up going to these coal pageants. She grew up going to the fair where the coal company takes you up on helicopter rides up and down, right? So it's like a completely different world that I had not personally been exposed to, even though, you know, I've obviously been around her family for, you know, more than a decade. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't grow up doing those things. So just sort of seeing sort of the, the culture of coal even more uh, deeply and, and thoroughly than I have ever before was quite illuminating and really fun to explore. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So I had a question about the character of King Cole specifically. Like, where in the process? He's not real. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Um, where in the process did that thought process or that character kind of develop, or did was it a starting point? I don't think it was a starting point. I remember 
at one point we asked people what they, when they think about King Cole, the likeness or image or, you know, and some people were like, Nat King Cole? You know, like it was, some people just didn't even register with them. But people, we asked people we filmed with, sort of what does this figure, um, what image does it call up in your mind and what feelings is, are associated with that? Um, but I think it felt like kind of a moving thing, right? And like it, it, it didn't, we, I don't know that we necessarily settled on this one particular definition of King Cole. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, obviously King Cole is like an industry, right? That we've used that term for a long time. Uh, the book King Cole, which I, I wish Elaine was here, I don't know. <laughs> uh, written in the 40s, I think, 40s, 50s. Um, so there's always been sort of that like King Cole, oh, right? Sinclair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, Molly. Um, and so, you know, there's King Cole Chevrolet and King Cole Highway, right, and King Cole Festival. So King Cole as a, as a moniker has been used for a long time to describe sort of the industry as a whole. Um, and so I think it was really just like, how do you personify that, right? How do you create a character and what is that character, right? Is it, is it just an industry? Um, and it was actually props to uh, Elaine's mom, Rita, when she at, finally asked Rita, she's like, you know, what, what is King Cole? And she's like, well, he's not really alive anymore because it's not as thriving as it was when you were little, but he's not dead, so I guess he's a ghost. And Elaine's like, oh, yes. <laughs> so uh, Rita McMillian uh, wrote that beautiful line. Um, and so, yeah, once, once uh, that was kind of hit on, that King Cole is this ghost that, that is sort of over the land, you know, not yet, uh, not dead, but not alive, and sort of still, still around, um, that really sort of set it off on kind of what it be could become. And then obviously, like, the breath artist and all that stuff really added to sort of the personification of, of King Cole. Yeah. yeah, I don't have so much as a question, but... I was very interested in that the the funeral scene, and could you just tell me a little bit how that was developed, how how that came about? Hi, Uncle Jim. <laughs> this is my Uncle Jim, everyone. Um, <laughs> Uncle Jim grew up in Farmington. Um, yeah, so the funeral the funeral we wanted to be both a scene for this film and also an event where people could talk about how coal, like what role it's played in their lives um, and what it's meant to them, what it's taken from them if they, if they wanted to go there. And Corinne mentioned Heather Hanna's uh, remarks at the end. I mean, we, we didn't know what she was going to say and we were all really blown away by how poetic and meaningful um, her speech was. So the event needed to land both as a scene for the film and as a um, and as, a, as an event where people could could share stories. And I mean, logistically, that was challenging. Um, that where we we filmed that at a, um, a place called Benedict Hade Farm near Charleston, where um, like a music video, I think a metal band had a music video there, and uh, we. In something like that wide shot right at the beginning, right? We had to make sure there was nothing visible in the scene that would that already existed at this venue, like a porta potty or something, you know. Um, and then we had to, like, we just had to work both. The logistics were both for the scene itself and for the event, and, and to make sure we could accommodate all the people that we had. We had like I think almost a hundred people. Um, it rained, it poured the rain, which made for a really beautiful scene, but um, I think we had like 100 black umbrellas we ended up with after the shoot. Um, so, yeah. If anybody needs them, I sell them out of them, I chuck in my car. Black oh, no, they're all, I have all of them. I have like 50 black umbrellas still. Um, but yeah, so it was, you know, we, we had approached people and said, would you like to share something? And again, it was about 90 minutes. So there's, there's only a fraction of it in the film, but uh, we, all kinds of people spoke and um, they gave us a sense of what they were going to say, but for the most part it was, uh, you know, we, we, we didn't tell them what to, we, not at all, we didn't tell them what to say. It was just really, um, they, they came prepared and, um, and I, I hope that it was meaningful to them as well. A uh, incredible film, it's so moving, um, very inspired. Um, uh, and very timely, too, for so much. Um, I just want to see, uh, hear if you had witnessed any coal miners who had actually watched the film and what their response was to the film and, and uh, any 
yeah. coal miners. Yeah, coal miners or yeah. any, one in, in the industry. Yeah. yeah, I think kind of the, the two biggest uh, hurdles is Elaine's dad, Randy, who's worked in the coal industry for 45 years, uh, maybe 40. And then Lainey's dad, who's also worked in the coal mines for a long time. So uh, we premiered the film in January, and in December we got um, in Charleston, uh, we rented a small theater and showed it to Lainey, Gabby, and their families. Um, and, you know, it's, I, we were all sweating bullets because, uh, you know, there's Lainey's dad. He's this, you know, big dude. He's probably like 6'6", six, six, you know, sort of kind of intimidating ex-coal miner. Still works in the coal industry. Um, but after the film, you know, he was just sobbing, you know, just crying. And, and you know, Elaine just asked him a question like, what would you think? And, um, you know, he could barely kind of get anything out. And he's just like, you told the truth. Um, and I think as soon as he said that, you know, that was like, Elaine's like, you know, I'm all right, I'm in the clear. Um, and that's, you know, that's her, his, you know, little daughter <laughs> and has sort of the face of the whole film. So, um, and then I think, you know, um, Elaine's dad and the coal miners and her family have had the same reaction of like, you know, uh, obviously it has provided and it is a very strong industry, but we all understand that it's not what it was, right? I mean, we heard in the, the, in the voiceover that 140,000 people worked in the mines and now it's 12,000. So, you know, that's less than 10%, easy math. Um, and so I think a lot of other coal miners across the region have had a similar reaction. You know, I, I think they all lament the loss of the, the industry and the brotherhood, you know. Um, Elaine's brother still just loves the, the work because of the sort of the brotherhood of the mines, right? It's, it's a dangerous job and there's a pride to it. And so I think the, the, it's the loss of that um, that I think saddens people, but I think it's also very nicely reflected in this film. I, I thought the, uh, I love traditional Appalachian music, you know, and uh, the absence of it was really a fantastic choice, I thought. I just thought it gave it a completely different texture. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean... I think the percussion... Um, Especially in the theater with, like, surround sound. Yeah. Yeah, just yes. great. Right. I, uh, I think the... If I remember right, what we talked about, or Elaine mentioned the drum beat of coal, right? Just that it was... Like sort of it's kind of a primitive too. Yeah, and 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 I think the the focus was to try to capture that, like that scene when the mingo oak is falling, that coal, 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 like the drumbeat of coal, and um, and to and to incorporate all those percussive elements. And we, um, and I, I really love too how like the Shodake's breath art also became sort of part of the score in a way, and the and the whistling that you heard as well. Um, do you have any more to say about that? Uh, no, I, I think that's that's sort of the biggest note is right. There's like, what is King Cole's soundtrack, right? And it's probably it's like, when, what is a kingdom? What is when you're marching through the streets of a kingdom? What do you hear, right? It's the drum beat, the boom, 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 boom. Um, and so I think we, all the score is around that percussive element. And then I would just add that you know when you hear a banjo or a, a fiddle pull, right, you automatically have images in your mind, right, of years and years and decades and decades of Appalachian films, um, you know, good or bad. And so this film obviously subverts a lot of those sort of ingrained images in our mind of, of Appalachia. Um, and so having a different, a different soundtrack uh, just seemed fitting. I also wanted to say the, um, the continuous minor with this sound was it's probably the best continuous minor footage ever taken, right? Don't you think? I hope so. Elaine shot that yeah. 10 years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, for her project called Hollow. And so we... Cause, oh, that was for Hollow. Yeah, that was for Hollow. So maybe 11, 12 years ago at this point. So um, it wasn't in the movie until very late. And, and you know, I think we all kind of decided, like, we got to have some coal mining in this movie. Um, and so... Yeah, she pulled that out of the out of the vault, and we just amplified sort of all the the visual or the audios and the and uh, the sound. So that was of the HD. Huh? That was. I don't. Even. I don't think they let you get as close uh, to the continuous miner like she did. Then <laughs> I mean, she was staying in front of the coal miner next to the continuous miner. So you know what you do when you're 23 years old. Did you try to get something equivalent in mountaintop removal? No, um, I don't. I don't think we did. Really, this the one image of the near the football field scene, I think is the only, and then some of the archival touches on that as well. Um, 
yeah, we wanted to, I mean, I think we would have filmed in a coal mine again if we had the chance, but uh, it's really difficult. And so we went into the Beckley Exhibition Coal Mine, which you saw, and there's also this wonderful exhibition coal mine in Lynch, Kentucky, where we filmed, um, uh, that isn't in the film, but is a really special place. Yeah, so. well, beautifully shot, wonderful movie. Uh, I did have one last question. We can kind of close it down with this, but um, you talked a little bit in the beginning about the, uh, you know, going away from that verite filmmaking, which obviously Elaine has kind of made a name for herself doing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what, what was that process like when you realized you needed to start to go away from that? Like, what other options did you explore and kind of what was that transition like? It really happened during COVID. We couldn't film anything. <laughs> and so we went into a, a period of time where we did a lot of research and, and um, you know, reading books and just thinking of ideas and the three of us going to, into the forest and just filming stuff and seeing if it <laughs> made any sense. Um, and, and yeah, we had a bunch of scenes um, like the ones you saw in the beginning in the classroom and the pageant. And, um, and I remember th we had this conversation at one point. We didn't want people to see those and think they were a punchline because they're not. I mean, they're really there's there's some moments that are kind of quirky or you know puzzling, or, but there's a lot of really meaningful um, moments in that footage. Um, but we didn't. It, I think in order to tell the story. Um, Kids are such a great way to do that, right? Kids are such a great way to think about the future and to imagine. And in order to um, to tell that story, we had to find these kids. And we were so we were kind of. I think it happened slowly. And then, of course, with Elaine incorporating some of her um, many of her experiences and um, her family history, uh, that to be woven in. It was, I don't know, it, it happened slowly, I think, over time. And, and maybe there wasn't one conversation where we decided we had to do it, but it, it made sense um, as it unfolded. Yeah, I think I'll just add, when you're, when you're making an observational verite film, you're sort of beholden to whatever you, it is you capture, right? It's when you're doing uh, Recovery Boys or Heroin or even Country Brawlers, right? Whatever the, uh, the uh, characters in the film do, that's your film, right? And in a lot of ways, that's very limiting when you yourself have something you want to say. You know, and, and a lot of oftentimes I'll be behind the camera like, come on, Corky, say it, come on, Corky, oh, come on. Um, so you kind of, it's, it's, some, some, it's a very frustrating process if you're, if you're trying to say something specific um, and trying to do that through observational film. And so I think it's fairly obvious in this film that Elaine had something to say. Um, and I, I think, you know, once, once she filmed some cool events just because, you know, they were dying um, and, it, and, you know, it had some time to sit back and reflect, it's like, well, what, what do I, Elaine, want to say about my past, um, my beliefs, my beliefs on Appalachia, coal, all, everything that she's, you know, thought about for her whole life? You know, what is it that, that um, you know, she really wanted to get across and just observational verite filmmaking is just not a medium for that. Um, and so then it shifted very much so into kind of what, um, yeah, what is it she wanted to say and what was the best way to do that? And so, yeah, this uh, doc documentary fable is the result. Well, it was very beautiful and to experience here was really awesome. So thank you two for joining us this evening and letting us ask questions and yeah, one more round thank of you. applause for them. Thank you very much. Thank you.